friends, and welcome to another episode of Chapters on Armstrong Television. Today, we are thrilled to have um, our guest, Tim Huguenin, Timothy G. Huguenin, to be precise. Tim says he's a hillbilly writer of the strange and spooky, hailing from the Allegheny Mountains of West Virginia. His current books include When the Watcher Shakes, which won the 2021 Indie Author Project Regional Award for West Virginia. Little One and Unknowing I Sink. Welcome, Tim. It's great to have you. And I'm your host, host Carter Seaton. So good to see you. Thanks, Carter. It's great to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations on that award. Tell me about that competition. Was it something you had to enter or were you just plucked out of the air? Uh, yeah, that was something I entered. I believe I learned about it through the West Virginia Writers uh, newsletter um, when it came out um, in, in uh, I forget which, which month, but in 2020, they had a listing there to submit for that. And so I submitted and then kind of forgot about it. And um, when I got the email uh, that I had won for West Virginia, I kind of had to check and make sure, like, is this a real thing, you know? <laughs> uh, I, I had forgotten about entering it. And, uh, and then I looked at it and I'm like, oh, this is cool. You know, I got a, an award. I got some prize money. So I was really happy about that. That's great. Good for you. All right. Where in the Allegheny Mountains do you live? I, my wife and I, just moved to Elkins, West Virginia. And we've been kind of um, moving around outside of Elkins for a while now. We lived in Bartow for a little while and then in Tucker County um, in, on Texas Mountain, which is in Parsons, but not really in Parsons. Um, although we finally uh, were able to get a house in Elkins and we're really enjoying it here. That's great. Do the uh, mountains there inspire your writing? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, uh, I, I love the mountains, um, uh, all over West Virginia, every part of West Virginia has got its own little flavor and it all, all inspires me. Um, and the people too. Um, I, I mean, the West Virginia is beautiful in the land, but also beautiful in a lot of great people. And, um, I try to always stay respectful of that and, and kind of shining a light on all the, the, the beauty in both, both aspects of West Virginia when I write. That's great. Um, do you think there are ghosts in them, in them hills? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I, I hear a lot of stories. I've never seen a ghost myself, for sure, but I've heard enough stories to, uh, from other people about <laughs> strange right. things happening. Well, so what inspires the uh, strange and the spooky in your writing? You know, I've always loved, uh, I've always been drawn to that. Uh, when I was a kid, I... Uh, um, and maybe middle school or beginning of high school, I really got into reading Edgar Allan Poe. And um, that was really a big uh, inspiration for me. And, you know, in West Virginia, you've kind of got a tradition of campfire stories. Uh, a yeah. lot of times they're spooky. Um, and, you know, in Boy Scouts, we'd always try to freak, freak each other out a little bit in the tent and stuff. So um, I guess it's just, uh, I don't really have a good explanation for it. It's just what I like. <laughs> Is that what you read now for pleasure? Yes, I, I do. Um, I read a lot of Stephen King um, and I read, I try to stay current on some of the newer authors in horror that are coming out. I really love Stephen Graham Jones. He wrote a book called The Only Good Indians that was just really good. Um, and, uh, but I also read other, I read all across uh, genres. I really uh, have been reading a lot of Hemingway lately. Mm -hmm. um, I really love Denise Giardina. She's probably my favorite author. She's a West Virginia author. Mm -hmm. um, Davis Grubb. I'm a big fan of Davis Grubb as well, who also wrote some, uh, some kind of ghost stories stuff. And yeah, it, right. Uh, yeah. So um, do you have a favorite author? If you had to pick just one? Just one. Just one of all. T that's really tough. Yeah. Um, I, uh Man, I, I guess I would have to go with, uh, I think it changes sometimes. Mm -hmm. For a long time, I'd say Denise Giardina. Um, Storming Heaven is one of my favorite books of all time. Um, but to be honest, I've, only, I've, I've read a few of her books, but I've read a lot more Stephen King. So if you just went by volume of books read, it's probably Stephen yeah. King. Right. All right. I have to confess that this is not necessarily the kind of story I read. 
Yeah, it's... Um, but I was so caught up in it. It's uh, I really enjoyed when the watcher shakes. Thank you. Um, give us a little kind of an overview of it. Yeah, uh, when the watcher shakes is um, uh, when I just have like a couple of seconds. I usually tell people it's like a creepy cult in the woods kind of book. Um, it's about a backpacker who kind of stumbles upon this walled town hidden in the Appalachian Mountains uh, in West Virginia. And um, he discovers a, a strange kind of religious sect there that uh, turns out they're not real friendly towards outsiders. And um, yeah, uh, it deals a lot with um, kind of people using religion as a way to control people and as like a political vehicle for power rather than what it's really, you know, supposed to be for with connecting to God and things like that. Yeah, I kind of saw it as a morality play gone wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, did, did, what inspired that? Did, was there some, have you read about some like cult gone wrong or an overbearing minister that you knew in your past? I don't have a particular uh, person in mind when it comes to that, but I have experienced and seen some, uh, especially, you know, you hear on the news of, of, of uh, ministers who end up, you, it turns out they've been really abusing their power in a lot of really gross gross ways. Um, I, I've uh, kind of visited some pretty strict churches where I wouldn't say they're like this, you know, obviously this is fiction. Um, but, uh, you know, some people kind of let their, um, their traditions kind of shape their worldview in a way that makes them kind of blind to kind of what's going on for real. I wouldn't say that I've ever been like a member of like churches long term. Um, that way but i i've you know kind of been on the periphery of that and seen that happen um you know so well, like, i guess the the obvious of course is jim jones yeah but you know it's the catholic church has been accused of overstepping for certain and yeah yeah you know. and it, it's so yeah it's so i feel like what uh and you it seems a lot when there's i mean small churches too but you know there's you get these big mega churches and stuff and I think that when you get in a situation where one person has like that much power and um, I don't, I don't think it's healthy. I think it, it corrupts mm -hmm. the mind and, and, you know, I mean, it can happen to anybody, I guess. Well, right. hopefully not anybody, but. Well, your primary character in that church is really creepy guy, Rob Cowan. Yeah, I was, I was trying to make him so, yeah. So he was, he, you succeeded. <laughs> he was definitely creepy. And I think there's a lot of symbolism in that book too. I saw the clock, the clock sort of as the the church, um, the walls maybe were surrounding what they considered heaven, and that outside it was hell where mount monsters lived. Mm. Am I reading too much into it? Uh, you know, that's a really interesting. I, I I did kind of put some symbols in there, and um, I'm always interested in how people interpret that. Um, that's a really interesting take on that where the, the, you know, heaven within, uh, within and the hell outside. I haven't thought of that before, but that's a really interesting way to think of it. Yeah. I, I think that the way I was thinking of the walls is a lot of churches become very insular and they don't even go out into the community where they're supposed to be, mm -hmm. um, living with people and loving them and, and, in, in a, and, uh, even may they may do that, but they'll think, oh, this is the outside world and I can't, can't uh, you know they don't relate to them properly mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. they really hide from that when they should be going towards them right so is this your third novel um you know what it was a it was my first novel and then I wow. I wrote it in 2016 and I did a, a new edition of it I had a um, um I went back and kind of smoothed out some of my more awkward writing and and got a really nice new cover and I uh, released that in 2019 I think the the, the new edition mm -hmm. um I have so I have two full published novels out right now and I have several novels that haven't been published yet and, do they uh, all have I, I know you you say you you specialize in the strange and the spooky but do they also have sort of subtle messages about life like this one does 
Um, you know, I would say my second novel, Little One, there's definitely a little bit of a, a thing at the end about um, holding on to anger and people that have wronged you and just letting that kind of um, make you bitter inside. Uh, not to get people who have wronged you off the hook. Obviously, if you, you know, I'm not a fan of just letting people get away with crimes. Um, but for you, if you're the victim, you know, uh, learning to, to move past that. And so that, that comes out a lot in little one, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, um, my novella, I have a novella out that, um, doesn't, I don't think it really has any message at all. I think it's just weird. <laughs> <laughs> now, which one is that? Is that the one unknowing I sink? Yes. That's unknowing I sink. Yeah. Okay. Which is also, yeah, it's also, uh, the first first edition of that is out of print now and i'm working on getting a new edition out there so give us a little synopsis of it uh yeah that one is the hardest one for me to to summarize it it's basically about a boy who uh he want he's in high school and he wants to impress a girl so he gets a job um cleaning this guy's um house it's a mansion but the mansion is all set up with uh, security cameras and the sound speaker so that the guy communicates with this boy as he cleans and and can see everything he's doing but never um, when the boy finally meets him he's um, very strange he's kind of got some kind of illness that keeps him uh, bedridden but um, he he had he he starts giving these boys these really strange like thoughts on philosophy and and weird just says a bunch of weird stuff and as the boy cleans the mansion um, he also notices these terracotta statues that seem to move around in different places, um, never seem to be in the right spot, but obviously the man can't be moving them because he's stuck um, on in bed. So, um, but I, I uh, uh, that's, that's about all I can say about that one. It's yeah. just strange. <laughs> <laughs> have you written short stories as well? Yeah, I have. I've written, I don't know the number. Um, uh, but I have had several short stories published in different magazines online and in print and actually in podcasts too. There's a couple that are on the uh, podcast called Tales to Terrify oh, that wow. is free to listen to. Um, and all and, and all my published short stories, you can, I have a list of them on my website um, and kind of a link to them where they can either be where the, if it's published in a magazine or something, if it can still be purchased, there'll be a link to that. And if it's free online or something, there'll be a link to that too. And what's your website? Um, my website is tghuganin.com, but it also, I know that on, in a situation like this, it's really hard to um, spell that out. Um, so if you go to mountainhorror.com, that'll redirect to, to my website okay. as well. All right. Um, so there's writing, your writing is considered genre fiction. Mm -hmm. And they say that in genre fiction, there are certain tropes that you have to use. For instance, in romance, there has to be a happy ever after sort of thing. <laughs> so what is it with strange, spooky, maybe scary horror fiction? Well, um, there's a lot of horror is such a huge uh, category in genres in a lot of ways that um, it, there are so many different subgenres. You know, you've got um haunted house like ghost stories where well you're going to have to have a ghost in there um <laughs> uh you know you've got um you got monster stories you know so obviously a lot of the times you're really aiming for scaring or being scary um although that's not always the case in horror sometimes it can go different ways and and what is actually scary is so subjective that you can't just always categorize something as horror based on whether or not it scares you or not. Um, but that is something that I'm trying to do when uh, trying to make it as spooky as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, other things that are typically in the horror genre, a lot of times you deal with mortality and, um, you know, dark darkness of just the human experience. Sometimes there's a lot of um things about our humanity that is not enjoyable and um horror writers like to contemplate that a little bit um where so you, yeah where, where'd you learn writing is there a, is there um specific 
creative writing classes that um, that lend themselves to this kind of fiction? Um, you know, there are. I don't think I've actually taken any classes that have been um, specifically geared towards horror or even genre writing. I did take some creative writing classes in college. Um, a lot of it, I I read books like Stephen King has a book about writing called On Writing, right. which is a great book even for anybody, any kind of writer. Yeah, true, it is. Yeah, and, um, you know, uh, I, I know there's actually some colleges that are kind of going leaning more into the genre writing I think uh I believe Seton Hill University has some genre writing uh courses mm -hmm. and um um and, and then of course there are I'm sure there are like online master class type courses by various scary mm -hmm. writers and stuff right where'd you go to college well I went to um Bob Jones University for two years that's a little school in South Carolina and then um, after I switched majors and transferred over, I was actually a creative writing major there uh, while I was there. And then I uh, decided to switch majors and transfer to a little school in um, the Beckley area called Appalachian Bible College. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, have you since taken like workshops and creative writing classes? I've picked up a few like small little workshops here and there from different events, not real long, uh, intensive mm -hmm. ones, but I know, I think uh, when I started getting more serious after college about writing again, I went to a, a workshop in Lewisburg that, um, that I don't know who organized it. I think Eric Fritzius probably put it together, but it was kind of like a two, um, two kind of work. One part of the workshop was, by Michael Nost, oh, yeah. West Virginia horror writer. And then the other one uh, was put on by Marie Manila. Um, and I, and both of them were on like kind of right after the other or something on the same day. I think I went to both of those. Um, and, you know, I, I've gone to several different kinds of conferences. I go to the West Virginia Writers Conference. And I uh, just went to that one this June, um, went to some cool workshops there. Um, there's a big conference every year called StokerCon, which is put on by the Horror mm -hmm. Writers Association. I went to that one uh, uh, several years ago. It doesn't feel like it was that long ago, but I guess it was. Uh, um, and so, you know, I, I haven't done any real intensive training or anything, but, you know, I pick up some new things here and there. But uh, most of what I learn about writing is just from reading. Yeah. Is, is writing your full-time gig or do you actually have a, what they call a day job? Yeah, I, uh, I am a substitute teacher here in, in Randolph County. Uh, I've been doing that for a few years or a couple years. Uh, I actually, the funny story about that is uh, I got my sub license for Randolph County and signed the contract two day, two or three days before in, in 2020, two or three days before they shut the schools down. <laughs> so uh, I didn't get a lot of uh, work in that, that year, but when they opened up, I started subbing there again. And my wife, uh, she really pays the bills. Uh, she has a really good job and uh, she's the director for a son, West Virginia, um, which is uh, a pretty cool program that is kind of a uh, WVU writes the check. I don't. Um, mm -hmm. Cool. Um, how do you fit writing into your life when you're having to teach? I know summers are always good for teachers because then they've got their you know, full time to do it. But during the school year, do you manage to do any writing or do you just wait and do it in the summer? Uh, I try to do it during the school year. Um, I found that sometimes if if I'm having a good day, I can fit some writing in during like the planning period since as a sub, I don't really have to plan anything. Uh, so it's just some extra time there I can use. Um, in the past, I've uh, sometimes been able to go straight from school to a library and write there since school, you know, ends kind of early in the day. Sometimes I can write between then to school and dinner time. And, um, and then, you know, I'm not, not subbing every day. So, uh, you know, on the, my days that I'm not working at the school, I'll work at home. So. That's great. That's great. Um, do, do you, you said you try to write every day. Do you, there's no real way for you to set a routine to do that. There is a 
Yeah, I, I uh, it, it takes, I am not good at um, um, getting that routine locked in is hard for me sometimes. Mm -hmm. And when it gets thrown off, it really messes. Like I, you know, honestly, we moved in May to Elkins and I haven't written anything since then because I've just uh, been trying to, re you know, cleaning the house, buying furniture and just kind of getting everything mm -hmm. set up. I've just been so busy. And then once you get thrown off your routine, then it's like uh, harder to get back to it. Exactly. Yeah. So it is a, is a challenge. Um, uh, but uh, once once I get in, you know, once you've been doing it, uh, I mean, you know, this um, the, once you do get on it, then the more you write, the easier it is. So I just have to try to get back in it. <laughs> and what are you going to work on next? Or what did you have that you were working on when you? Moved? I am working on a series of middle school um, holiday horror books, uh, like kind of like Goosebumps kind of style, but they're set on different holidays. So I have one that I've I finished um, called Garth on the Hearth. It's about an off-brand elf on the shelf that comes alive <laughs> and scares this boy. Um, and so that one is finished and uh, I am currently working on a Thanksgiving one called Gobbler of Fire. So uh, uh, I got some other ideas for Easter themed ones, but uh, yeah, that's what I'm currently working on right now. That's cool. Now, middle school books, will they have uh, any illustrations? They won't be like graphic novels? Um, I don't think they'll be like graphic novels. I, I mean, I guess that's up to the publisher. I've got uh -huh. an agent right now that's pitching Garth on the Hearth to different uh, children's publishers. Um, so we'll just see what hap happens with that. That's interesting. How many do you think there'll be? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess. Uh, All the major right holidays. Now, yeah. I mean, we've got a lot of holidays <laughs> <laughs> going too. So that's true. Uh, right. Right. Um, do you have a, a, an absolute favorite horror book, whether it's a contemporary writer or somebody like Poe? Um, I think Dracula seems to really hold up really well. I really love Dracula a lot. And it, um, the first time I read it, I was um, in a tent um, with this crazy thunderstorm going on. I remember reading it while John Harker's trying to escape from Dracula's castle. And, and it was just like this crazy lightning storm outside. So it really added to that. So I don't know if every time I read it, I'm thinking of that, which helps. Mm -hmm. But um, but that might, I guess I'd have to say probably Dracula for my favorite, at least favorite classic book. Mm -hmm. um, what about horror films? Do you find that novels translate well to a film? I think it depends on the novel. I think there have been some good, good ones, and then, uh, but film is such a such a different medium that mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know, I really don't get upset anymore when any kind of book is changed when it gets adapted for the film because you haven't ruined the book. The book's still right there on the shelf, um, and I and I kind of look at it these days where if something, you know, I already know what the story is if I've read it. So it'd be cool to see if there's something new done with that. Mm, so, um, um, so yeah, I, I don't know if, uh, like, I, but like I said, yeah, it, um, it's so different. So it really depends on the book and it depends on the film, what's mm -hmm. being made. There are so I've noticed there are some really interesting things you can do with film that is hard for me to do in books, especially for horror. Because, you know, with a book, you usually have to follow somebody's point of view. Yeah. And if you go outside of that, it, it kind of jars the reader. If, but in horror, you can have, you know, those really creepy scenes in a movie where, for instance, a person looks in the mirror at their reflection and they turn around and the reflection is still looking at them. You know, you can't do that with a book because um, it, unless you have a very particular point of view that you have to kind of sustain a little longer. Mm -hmm. but it was not really a normal thing or you could what is it they call it the break in the third wall yeah mm -hmm. yeah that's interesting um after this series do you have i mean where do you where do your ideas come from do you just you know you've got this series but i know you must have other ideas percolating and 
do you write down notes to yourself as you go, you know, through your day? Some, sometimes I have, sometimes I do take some notes on some ideas I have. Um, and other times I just kind of see if the idea is strong enough for me to remember over time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, sort of a test for yourself huh yeah uh, I've had some I get a lot of ideas just being outside and um, uh, I, I'm really inspired by nature and so some of my uh, some of my books that haven't been published yet um, are very like dependent on like natural setting and stuff you know when you're when you're you're supposed to be writing and you find all sorts of other things to do instead. Yes. <laughs> um, so I was do, doing a lot of weeding. <laughs> it was good for the garden when I was trying to write. And um, when I was out there, I was thinking about um, this chicken that I used to have, who got eaten by a pig. And um, and I decided to write a short story from written from the stream of consciousness of a chicken um and that was a really interesting experiment that nobody wants to publish <laughs> but uh uh but yeah so uh, yeah I, they just come out of nowhere sometimes you know i don't know well all right those the books that you've got kind of the orphan books that are sitting in a shelf are you still trying to get those published or what will you do will you self-publish them maybe someday uh, maybe but I, I just got an agent at the beginning of this year so we're going to see uh what she can do with some that's of those good. manuscripts. That's um, good. Yeah, I'm really happy about that. That's great. Um, all right, tell us again about how viewers can get your books and what helps a writer. If, if you, for instance, if you buy one of your books, how do they? How can they go and review it so that it helps you buy and helps you sell more books? Um, well. Uh, we all got to face the fact that uh, the main place most people buy books is on Amazon. Right. So um, if anybody, uh, people don't think about this, and I don't even always think about this, but leaving Amazon reviews really helps authors, especially like uh, authors like me that don't have name brand recognition. Because when people are looking at a book and they don't know who it's by, they see some good reviews that might convince them to buy it. So, you know, any any authors, especially um, smaller authors that you know if you like their books make sure you review them on Amazon and also Goodreads right. um, and um, you can find all my books on Amazon that are out right now except uh, yeah I mean like I said my novella is in between editions and it's out of print so you can't get the print or ebook version of Amazon although it is still on audible right now mm -hmm. okay. um, but yeah, and if you go to my website, there are links to where you can find my books. Okay, and it's T G Huguenin, H U G U E N I N dot com. That's correct. Yeah, Tim, it's been a real pleasure to have you. Thanks so much for talking to us about your books and your creepy ideas. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It's been and great I really enjoyed The Watcher. That's that's a good book. Great, that's good to hear. Thank you. Connect with Chapters through email. Write to lp4 at zoominternet.net. Chapters has a Facebook page at Armstrong Chapters. Like, subscribe, share, and comment. All Chapters episodes are available on YouTube. Visit the Armstrong Neighborhood channel on YouTube and look for a playlist of all the Chapters programs.